LC family, and we all know it's Black History Month. So we're here celebrating Black History Month with a very well-known accredited director. Her name is Gaddy Content George. Uh, do you mind not introducing yourself for us, Gaddy? Hey, my name is Gaddy Conte George. I am a um, filmmaker, so I direct, I produce, I edit. Um, I've been working in the industry for, um, I guess, about almost 15 years now. Wow. And uh, I have a production company. I, I just founded a production company with uh, my uh, producing partner, Allison Duke, called Oya Media Group. I um, went to film school, went to university in New Orleans, and uh, when I came back to Toronto, um, I found I had a really hard time getting into the industry because um, uh, prior to that I didn't really have much of an interest in the field so I had no connections I, um, and all that so I literally went up to a producer at um, when University Creative Summit when that used to happen I went up to a producer who was at the time directing or um, producing creating content that I enjoyed watching. And I just said, can I volunteer for your, at your production office? Oh, that's nice, so you started volunteering. So I started volunteering, mm -hmm. and in two weeks, I was on the payroll. Wow. Um, minimum wage doing research. Wow. And after a month, I was a production coordinator, and then I ended up directing two episodes of the documentary series that um, the company was producing. Oh, do you, so, do you remember the name of it? Um, yeah, it was uh, with Lita Serene Films. The producer was Frances Ann Sullivan, and okay. the series was called Liter Literature Alive. Oh, nice, nice. Yeah. So you, you enjoyed yourself on that, obviously. Oh, for sure, for sure, yeah. Oh, okay. So at first, coming into this occupation as a black woman in film, did you find other people that you could identify with? Um, yes and no. I found that there was a select few, like, um, I, I knew of people who were doing things in the industry, like Frances Ann Sullivan, Karen King, Allison Duke, um, Jennifer Holness, and Sud Sutherland. Like those were, but they felt um, kind of unreachable because they were making strides in the industry and not necessarily at um, the early stages. Okay. And so, my peers, I didn't. I. I didn't really have very many um, when I first started. So, I, so there was not very many like black women or even black maybe men um, to maybe reach out to and talk with and. Um, no, no. I mean, I found I reached, I reached out to my mentors, um, and they were more prominently. Yes, and like what? I'm not too sure. Um, were they black or were like? No, no. Yeah, black mentors. Oh, okay. But they, yeah, they, they, um, they. There definitely was an abundance in the industry. And how did that make you feel? Did, did that drive you to want to create the change? And this is why you kind of... Oh, for sure, for sure. I feel I've... Um, it's, there, there are a few of us doing great things, and I always thought that there should be more of us doing it, and there should be more of us to have access um, to, to the industry. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Good for you, good for you. So black women in the States seem to be slowly breaking through the barriers. What is the state for black women in the film in Canada? Um, I think there's a statistic in Canada, I believe something like 17% 17 of Canadian, okay, I might be misquoting, but there's a low number, I think under 30% of, of uh, films in Canada being made by women. Yes. And out of that number of women, the amount of them that are actually black women is mini school right. the number just goes even even further down wow. so there are very few of us um making films uh or i would say probably big budget films right i think there are um there's 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 a there's a shift there's definitely a shift um like with black women film which is a, an organization um based uh oh, black women film canada it's based in toronto but it expands and you know um, black women are involved from coast to coast that uh, and I think there's a movement now of more of us as creators um, producing content, getting our content out there, and being recognized for that. Wow, that's pretty good. Um, but uh, so I think I think we're in the middle of a, of a renaissance. Okay, yeah. so which is going to be like you know maybe an awareness where you guys are gonna reach out to more of the youth and try to get them on board maybe? Yes, yes. Uh, well, myself and my partner, Allison Duke, we actually do run a program called Pathways to Industry, oh. uh, Black Youth Pathways to Industry, which is a program for 
postgraduate black um, youth, 18 to 25, oh, nice. to steer them, to get them into the industry, something that I wish I had when I started. So uh, how, can they, how can they get, how, how can they find this information? Where can they go? Um, they can go to um, alisonduke.com, goldilocksproductions.com to find out more information. Uh, it's just a great program just to kind of show you these are the pathways, these are the ways to get into the industry, these are the different positions in the industry. Um, there's so many different ways to, to get working, to find work, to um, use it as a creative outlet. And a lot of the time, we just don't know about them. Right. This is know? good. And, this and we don't have access to them. So we're trying to break that barrier. Which is good. This is exactly what I think the community needs, especially us as colored people, you know. I feel like some, some, a lot of the times we have like a vision and we have this all this amazing work, but we don't know where to plug it and who to talk to. And so it's a great thing that you guys are doing here. Um, okay, so I, you touched base on this, but Oh Yeah Productions is a new company founded by you and Allison. How difficult was it for you guys to start the vision? Like, you know, how difficult was it to start it? Um, it wasn't difficult at all. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I say that because uh, Allison Duke comes with probably over 20 years of experience in the industry. Okay. I come in with, um, you know, 15 years in the industry. Okay, it's so and, like a powerhouse. And so it's been a long time coming. Good. You know, she's had her production company for many years. I've had my production for company for many years. And um, last year we decided to join forces. So that's where I say it was easy. Good. Getting to that point, but well, it wasn't necessarily easy. But yeah. coming up with this, it was more like, why didn't we do this sooner? <laughs> nice, good. Yeah. Good, good for you. I'm so I'm so proud, and actually, I, I think I'm going to take you up on that and take a look at it. Um, now, let's talk about your upcoming film, right? So, um, tell me about more about that. Okay, so Mr. Jane Finch yes. is a uh, TV one-hour uh, documentary about an 80-year-old community activist, um, Winston LaRose, who decided to uh, throw his hat in the political ring and take his community activism to the next level and run for city councillor oh. in this past Toronto municipal election. Okay, so you did like a full documentary on him. Mm -hmm. Oh, nice. So where is it being aired right now? Like, where can people see it? So it just had its world premiere at the Toronto Black Film Festival. Oh. Uh, we had a sold out crowd, standing ovations for Mr. The Rose. It was, uh, I'm still in awe. It was a surreal experience. And so uh, this Friday, it makes its uh, Canadian broadcast premiere on the CBC. Nice. Uh, so CBC POV, CBC Docs POV, and then also on CBC Gem, which is their um, app, their online um, streaming service okay. uh, that you can watch the film. So it premieres Friday at 9 p.m. Eastern, okay. and then after that, it's available continuously on the CBC Gem. Beautiful, so good, so good. Um, why do you think this documentary is of importance in the Jane Finch community? Um, I think it's of importance to the Jane Finch community because I think it's just um, a different story, a different narrative um, for that neighborhood, for that community. Uh, I think um, it's a neighborhood that has often been stigmatized, often ha always has one narrative, and uh, it's not a monolith. Um, like, you know, every community in the city in Canada uh, has many stories to tell from the device, diverse people who are from that community. Absolutely. And so I think this story takes um, a different perspective and shows a different um, uh, more of a Beautiful. realistic perspective of, of that community. Makes sense, makes sense. Um, how do you feel about the mask um, by black movement that has become a trend in North America? Is it becoming more popular now in Toronto as well? I think so, I think so. We have like the black owned markets that happen. I think I've seen it pop up like twice a year. I know some smaller ones happen other times. Uh, I think it's necessary. Definitely, kind of like, needs what, it. Kinda like I guess what you're doing with your movement with your partner, right? Mm -hmm. I guess it's kind of like that. Okay. Um, now this is the fun question. What are the biggest pet peeve in film in the film industry for you? And name a few, maybe. Maybe your top five. Top five pet, pet peeves. peeves. Well, I'm I'm a pretty positive person, and normally wears the you know the rose colored glasses. So I don't really, I, you know, normally I see negative as a and find the positives, but. One thing I would have to say that is a pet peeve is um, working with people who have a hard time taking direction from a female lead. Okay, yeah. Um, and uh, I find on, on, on threefold I face that as a woman, as a black person, and as someone who looks 20 years younger than I really am. Um, I find that sometimes it's really hard for people to 
yeah. follow my lead. I don't give them a reason not to, but um, and especially the um, camera operators I've had difficult times with wow. um, being able to listen to me yes. and people underestimating me, yes. people um, assuming I don't have the knowledge. Um, and But I feel like that happens in all facets of life. I think it also happens to racialize people to females quite often. Yes. So I just find that I've, um, I've, I've grown a thick skin to deal with it and to try to catch it early and to be very careful about who I work with. Okay. to make sure I um, don't get myself in those situations often. Have you ever gotten yourself in a situation? Okay, so like, explain to me, okay, give us all an example of maybe if, of one time when that happened and how did you handle it? So let's say I'm, I'm on set shooting a corporate video and I'm working with um, a DP, director of photography, camera operator, and uh, I say, okay, so I want to you know, let's say shoot this glass of water, um, can you just set up a close-up close shot? And like, as a director, like, I've told you the shot I want, I'm gonna walk away and do other, do other things I need to do to get through the shoot. I come back and it's set up differently. And I, that's, and then they tell me, okay, it's set up. So, but that's not what I told you, that's not how I told you to set it up. Right, okay. And then they say, okay, Okay, I see. and then I have to keep on repeating myself, and then this happens every time we have to set up the camera. So they just don't want to listen. They, they, to you. they just want to listen. They or they think they know better, or then they start telling me, actually, should you do this, this, and this? And there's a reason why I'm doing it the way I'm doing it in the order I'm doing it with. And I am all for collaboration, and I love getting feedback, and I love, you know, making the most out of every experience. So I'm very collaborative in my communication right. and in working and I give that that space right but then in that if you're going beyond that space and now start telling me what to do yeah then there's a problem because Definitely. that wasn't what I hired you to do or that's not what you're here to do so I find I've had that situation happen to me more than more than once, once. yeah well that's good at least you know you stay assertive and you know it's your vision and you execute it the way you want it to be done so that's good which is good um what advice would you give a person trying to start a company in the film industry and um, what are the challenges? I think um, in starting a production company, I think it's um, really doing your research because it's, it, the industry is so broad, the kinds of content you can create is so broad that you have to really, I think, know, um, one, your intent. Yeah. Um, to the kinds of projects you want to be doing and three understanding not just your audience but like who will be funding you um, understand who the gatekeepers are and how to get to them and how to present to them and then another thing I would say is um, really before you spend and invest in equipment understand what you're buying because technology changes you buy a camera, everything you buy is, it's like a buying a car. As soon as yeah, it comes it off the lot, the, it depreciates. Same thing, your camera, you open, you open the box, you push click, that camera now, the value has dropped. So really think about um, how you invest in your equipment um, and, and invest smartly. Like the first time I purchased a camera was when I got a green light on a series that I knew the budget for the series could pay for that camera. So I just find that like that, that was one of the biggest things I learned. I learned, I also, you know, get mentors and take advice and because I learned from other people's mistakes so that was one thing I learned early on was being careful about the equipment I buy because you don't want to spend ten thousand dollars on equipment that you'll use for one year or use for one production and then down the road it would have been cheaper for you to rent yeah um, Makes sense. so or finding a, a, a making sure because a lot of times people work on projects that are um, for the love Right. And their passion projects that don't always make money or they don't have the budget. So you have to really think about how you're going to feed yourself. Exactly. You know, I, I worked as a video editor for many years and I still do work as a video editor. And so when I do have a passion project that doesn't necessarily make money, I know I can still afford to pay my rent. Okay, which is, yeah, like, okay, so being an entrepreneur, touch base on that. Like, what advice would you give a person who's coming in and maybe not making top, top dollars? Like, what do you, how do, how do you suggest that they go about it? Like, well, don't quit your day job. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, and I should also say, when I went to that production company and said, I will work for you for free, yes. I was bartending. Oh. Okay. I was bartending at nights, okay. I was bartending on the weekends, and that's what paid my bills. Yes. Right? And wow. I also lived with my mom. <laughs> okay. okay. Right? I was fresh out of school. So, like that. Like, you just, you know, don't, don't live above, above your means. Artists do not make money. It's not an industry that makes very much money, especially at the beginning. I mean, yeah. you can make a lot of money later on. You can find ways. But starting off sometimes, like... I was doing um, wedding videos for free, then wedding videos for some money. Like I was, like it just, you have to kind of, um, you have to crawl before you walk, you know, and you have to walk before you run. So just slowly build your empire, you right. know. You just, you know, like overnight successes take 10 years to build, right? So it's like don't, um, and you can't fool yourself into thinking that, Anyone who looks like a great success now d didn't spend that time, those 10,000 hours, they say, right? Yes. And, you, and you really have to, 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 to give that time. You're so, right. Yeah. And I commend you because a lot of people really don't realize the work, the hard work that you had to put in, the schooling and, you know, sometimes the letdowns and the heartbreaks that mm -hmm. you had to go through to become where you are right now, you know, exactly. for us. So we commend you, you know, yeah, and we look you. up to you as and, a black oh, woman. One more piece of advice I'd say for people who are starting production companies is know the rules before you bake, break them. Like anyone can pick up a camera and shoot, but that doesn't make you a camera operator, doesn't no. make you a cinematographer. Yeah. So like, it, you know, I believe in the educational aspect of it and the training, you know, whether it's going to a traditional film school, whether it's taking courses at Lyft yeah. or OCAD um, or Ryerson or, you know, or wherever, you have to know the rules in order to break them. That's right. You know, I um, agree. And 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 I find you know you can you, you can YouTube and learn whatever your your way of learning is. You know, is yeah. is but learn first, and then you know go outside the box. Take that and say exactly. You know, learn how to build that box and then break it and do whatever you need to do. I, absolutely, I agree with you. Okay, so what were your best experiences so far in your professional career that we that you would like to share? Like maybe mm. the celebrities that you've met or somebody that's in your film that you've always wanted to work with? Um, I wouldn't say celebrities um, because those are fun. <laughs> but I think the real heartfelt moments, I think, for me was um, uh, getting a grant from the Sundance Documentary Fund. Oh, that's was, awesome. was huge. Sundance. Um, that's uh, been recognized and um, appreciated from them nice. uh, was, was a, a really a strong point. Um, shooting my first feature-length documentary, going to Sierra Leone. Oh, nice. Um, being able to go back home oh, wow. um, with a crew and film. Uh, so you had your own crew. So, yeah. That so was that, awesome. Tell me a little bit more about that. Yeah, so that was uh, my first feature-length documentary. It was about an amputee soccer team in Sierra Leone and their struggles with PS PTSD as they try to become world champions in amputee mm -hmm. soccer. So, uh, and I, so I filmed that over a two-year period um, and I got um, great support from that, from the Sundance Documentary Fund. Uh, we won the pitch at TIFF. Um, which also helped with the funding. We had awesome. a Kickstarter campaign back when Kickstarter f wasn't even in Canada yet. Wow, um, phenomenal. Yeah, <laughs> so that, that experience I think was huge. It will always be, you know, close Party. to my heart. Yeah. Um, uh, going to Sundance uh, as part of a development program was an amazing experience. Oh, and uh, that so that, if you want a celebrity moment there, I uh, went to <laughs> Ice T's documentary on the, the art of, of, of rap and writing, oh. and and then got to meet him. That's awesome. Um, at, at the at, at that screen, that was a great moment. Was that in Vancouver or was that here in Toronto? Oh no, Sundance. That was in Sundance in Utah. Oh, Utah. Okay, yeah. okay. I, yeah. For some reason, I'm thinking that Sundance was connected with the Vancouver location. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, no, no. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. awesome. Yeah. So how was the meeting? Uh, um, was it Ice Cube or... What was um, his name? It was it was Ice T. Ice T. Yeah, yeah. he yeah. looks he does, he does he look as good in person as he does. Oh, definitely, they all look the same, you know. And then like sitting in the audience and seeing other, you know, celebs was, was cool. You well, know? you it's belong there. To, it's always fun to have those celeb experiences and then you know come back to real life. Nice, yeah. nice. Well, I yeah. think you belong there anyway. Um, so we are happy to have you here for this interview, right? And um, is there any way that that people can find you on social media? What's coming up? You know. Mm -hmm. So I like to hide on social media. So, <laughs> <What>? <laughs> but you can find my projects on social media. Okay. Um, 
Uh, Mr. Jaina Finch is uh, all across all social media platforms. It's Mr. And Jaina Finch, A N D. Okay. Um, so that's my latest project. Oya Media Group, my uh, production company, uh, is also on most platforms, um, and will be. It's fresh, so we'll be uh, launching our website in the next few weeks and um, things like that. Um, Wonderful. I don't personally have any public accounts for people to follow. <laughs> um, okay. my, my production company, which is a division of Oya, Matru Media, um, it has a website, matrumedia.com. Okay. Um, and you can follow me on Twitter, but I'm not on Twitter, so <laughs> I'm not sure what you'll see there. Uh-oh. But yeah, I'm still, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a slow adapter to the whole social world. Okay, but, no uh, problem. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if your next move is your best move, what is your next move? Is that right? So is my next move is my best move. Yeah, so if move. your next move is your best move, what is your next move? Make more films. <laughs> okay, yeah, more yeah. documentaries maybe? More documentaries. I mean, my next documentary is Ambitious. It's a 360 cinematic VR documentary. Um, and so that's going to take me into the whole world of VR, which is new to me. VR, tell us a little more. more. Virtual reality. Oh. You put on the goggles and you're taken into the world. Oh. Yeah, so I did, um, I did do one experimental shoot um, in Barbuda in the Caribbean. Um, and that's, that's the next subject matter of my next film. And so we'll be going back there and um, doing more of that. That sounds good. Do you need extras? Just <laughs> check it. Well, there you have it, everybody. Um, so we had Gaddy. Thank you for joining us here on the Sea Chats for Black History Month. My name is Mitzi Blair, and thank you guys all for tuning in. Take care. Thank you.